This would be the panel discussion for the customer stories. And we have a great panel today, so let me introduce uh, the panel. So uh, can I ask you to come up as well? So Daniel Silva, Miguel Lorente, and Seneca Fernando. Have a seat. Yeah. Um, you can start yeah. from the, I'll, yeah. I'll, OK, I'll go there. Yeah. It's OK. Um. Yeah, <laughs> it works. Yeah. All right. So. Daniel Silva is from uh, Farfetch. So Farfetch, uh, if you if you basically go onto the Farfetch uh, website, so Farfetch is basically a, a retail, a pretty large online retailer for luxury brands. So uh, they deal with around 700 partners and 700 goods and services. Right. Uh, so Daniel, uh, in his past life, uh, Daniel was uh, uh, in the interoperability space with uh, healthcare information systems provider. Uh, now Daniel is leading the integration platform for Farfetch. Uh, so in Daniel's past life, as part of Alert software, uh, Daniel basically worked with a lot of interoperability standards, including HL7 and the various uh, healthcare standards. So uh, Daniel is ideally suited here because we are talking about customer scenarios, but we are also talking about the importance of integration and how with the various products need to talk to other products, and that means interoperability plays a key role there. So welcome, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, Miguel Lorente is from uh, Valencia, Spain. Uh, I'm a big fan of Spain because of Barcelona. But then <laughs> we are now following the Catalonia uh, news as well. Right? Issue. So, yes, the, the issue, yes. Uh, Miguel is an R&D engineer at uh, Pro Develop. I got that right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, but Miguel also has an academic background as well. So Miguel has worked on a large amount of R&D projects, uh, especially the EU-funded projects for the region, and uh, also uh, uh, many Horizon 2020 projects. So Horizon 2020 is uh, EU's largest uh, grant agency, basically working on various uh, R&D projects. So Miguel has uh, a background in uh, electrical and electronics engineering as well, and industrial design. So Miguel has expertise in product design as well. Uh, so. From what I read, he's an expert on IoT. Uh, he's worked on the various IoT formats, the devices, and it was not a surprise that we were giving away an Amazon Alexa, <laughs> and then Miguel won the, the best uh, tweet award, and he got that as well. So you can add that to your list of devices. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's the next uh, challenge. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Seneca is our very own uh, WSO2 Solutions Architect. He's a director of Solutions Architecture from London. I mean, he claims to be a Londoner, but you've been in uh, Lon U UK for two years now? Three and a half years. Three and a half years, okay. That, that makes you a Londoner. Yes, that's right. So uh, Seneca has been with WSO2 from 2008. Uh, he's part of many standard organizations, and he's basically uh, he's an Apache PMC committer. He's an Axis 2 committer. Uh, he's part of the Oasis group uh, and, and many standards-based uh, uh, standards out there. Uh, Seneca was also the product lead for the governance registry some time back. Uh, you, there was some discussion about the governance registry and the evolution of uh, governance. So, so Seneca was a big part of that. So Seneca can bring his expertise in that area into this discussion. Uh, today, Seneca's role is as part of Director of Solutions Architecture. Uh, he basically deals with the customers in the UK and the EU region, helping them with uh, the, the solutions architecture requirements, uh, helping them with their various projects. If you're from the region, I'm sure you would have bumped into Seneca. And if not, uh, he will bump into you, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Welcome, Seneca. OK, so let me set the stage here. So we have uh, these three great speakers here. Uh, you had a number of uh, sessions today on customer use cases. Uh, there were a number of sessions yesterday as well on a, a couple of customer use cases as well. So. Today, we'll be basically going through uh, some of the questions that uh, I put together, and, and we'll have a panel discussion here. But at the same time, I also invite the audience members to uh, just think of the questions that you have, and then we will break in between uh, to accept questions from the audience. And, and you can uh, get your questions answered from any of the panel members. So there is a mic that can go around. So yes, the Zai here will basically go around with the mic. So if you have any questions. Uh, feel free to ask. OK, so let me start. Again, sorry. Uh, so I'm Mifan Karim. Uh, so that, yeah, thanks for that uh, introduction. So 
I'm Senior Director of Solutions Architecture, so I'm not from UK, I'm based out of the uh, New York office, but uh, it's always fun to come to London, and my, uh, my favorite club is Arsenal, so I try to come here as much as possible. Right. Okay, so uh, the first question basically, so Miguel and Daniel uh -huh. first, I'll start with Daniel. So can you explain your, the business requirements, uh, the business architecture for, of uh, what you try to solve using WSO2 and, and any challenges from the business perspective mm -hmm. and what, what this really means for business? Okay. Daniel? Okay, thank you. Thank you to WSO2 to, for the opportunity to be here okay. sharing my experience here today. Uh, so, um, Farfetch started in 2008 as, um, as um, a marketplace for, let's say, street, street boutiques to sell their products online. Uh, and now it, is, it, it grows to the point where uh, global brands are, are coming to us to sell their products on, on the platform. Um, so, at the beginning, there, was, uh, there isn't uh, um, this idea that uh, an integration uh, platform uh, will be needed. So this team is um, has like two years, uh, and when when this team was um, was created, uh, there was what we called uh, some mushrooms uh, in the in the company where uh, pointless applications connect to to different systems in the boutiques. Sometimes FTP servers getting CSV files, etc. So there was this confusion of, of uh, integrations um, between Farfetch and, and the partners. So two years ago, we, we, we created this team, the integrations team, um, where the objective is to, to organize all of the integrations between the Farfetch and the outside partners and create this centralized platform uh, in our architecture uh, so we can uh, do the same things the same way, uh, even if we are using uh, different systems from, from the partners outside. Okay? So this is the place where the integrations team is in, inside, uh, inside Farfetch. Um, the choose of WSO2 as our, as our technology was quite easy, I might say. Um, um, I can, I can, I, th I think the, the documentation is very good. Um, it is uh, very flexible uh, in terms of what we can do with the technology. Uh, as you can imagine, we have um, systems that, where we are getting uh, CSV files or we are uh, getting information from SOAP, w, uh, web services, REST, uh, web services with authentication, pagination, so we have a sort of different systems that we need to, to get information from and to, to put information in, uh, a wide range of different systems that, that we need to interact to. So WSO2 was, was this um, great technology that, that, that we choose. So documentation is very good. It is very uh, flexible, reliable. So we are now, uh, just keep growing, we, are, we have about like uh, uh, one million transactions each day and, and just keep growing. So I think I, I took my time now, oh, no. <laughs> or, but, but this is the place where, where uh, our team is inside Farfetch. We are like a satellite connecting all these different partners in, into, our, into our store. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. Um, Miguel, same yeah. question to you. <clears throat> and in so you also work on multiple projects as well as in including into IoT. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. How, how does WSO sort of address the business uh, requirement? Yeah, uh, well, uh, honestly, we are in WSO2 sort of by chance because it's not well known, um, at least uh, in Spain. Okay. Um, we didn't know about it, uh, but we have heard that some of our customers, uh, we uh, have a great um, business line in imports integration and imports IT, and some of our, our customers were starting to use WSO2 um, integration server, which is a port of Barcelona, port of Valencia as well. So in the context of the project in the IoT, which is an um, interoperability focused project, uh, we saw that the opportunity to use WSO2 also leveraging the, the uh, open source policy. So that was the, the reason starting investigating the different modules. I can remember perfectly the first uh, glimpses at the 
technology with my colleagues saying, oh my God, this can't work because they have almost everything. They, right. Because you have a, a huge ecosystem. So uh, almost everything can be solved from the point of view of the integration and even the analytics uh, by using WSO2 products. So um, that was the, the main reason, uh, starting in InterIoT. And right now, we are helping uh, the biggest terminal in the port of Valencia to um, improve their IoT strategy um, by using uh, WSO2 products as well. So this was a great opportunity to uh, have a deep knowledge of the, of the different uh, modules of the WSO2, and now we are implementing in a real customer. Right. Okay. Thanks. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks. So, Sena, because I'm not going to ask you the same question, obviously, right? So, uh, so for, for customers who are evaluating WSO2, so customers who come in as a lead to WSO2, how does the solutions architecture team engage, or how does WSO2 engage in helping them with that evaluation and deciding which path to go with? Yeah, so um, we have... Uh, is, okay. I hope it's fine. Right. I think you can hear me. Uh, so, in terms of uh, the customers who come to us, or prospects rather, at this stage, uh, we have had uh, prospects of uh, various sorts. You see, like some people like open source, some people like the capabilities of the products, uh, some people like the, the flexibility we give with cloud, and, and uh, we have a, a series of uh, various use cases coming to us. Uh, so, first point is, I think, uh, what uh, I would do, or I think anyone else in our team would do, is to try to understand your business requirement. Uh, and these business requirements are broad. Uh, people want to achieve uh, uh, so many things. And we then try to condense the business requirement to, you know, what do you want to do today, what do you want to do after that, what do you want to do uh, in one year, like that, right? And then uh, identify, like, what is the, press, uh, the, the, the first uh, production use case. And then come up with a, a sort of like a project uh, towards achieving that kind of use case. So we help in... Uh, various sorts, uh, based on the sizes of the teams customers have. Uh, some people are like uh, two or three people teams. Some people are, you know, like 100, 200 people teams. So we need to adapt according to these situations. Um, and uh, there are situations where we supplement these teams with our consultants. Sometimes uh, some of the use cases are so straightforward, you don't really need that. Uh, so it has been, a, uh, I think, a, a, an exercise for us to understand uh, what your business requirement is, uh, what kind of capability do you have in-house, uh, what do you want to achieve, how long do you have for that, uh, and then based on that, we then come up with an engagement model. That's, that's broadly, I think, the way we engage. All right, thank you. Uh, so I'll, I'll go back to Miguel now. So, uh, so ProDevelop, as I understood, is a company that uh, focuses on like various solutions, the port solutions, yeah. uh, interoperability solutions, yeah. geospatial solutions as yeah, well that's uh, in the open standards arena. <laughs> Um, so you have worked on multiple projects as a product designer, and in, in this project, I think you mentioned you've used the ESB, the, the analytic solution, yeah. the message broker, et cetera, mm -hmm. to build your solutions. Uh, can you explain why you use those products and how exactly they are used in your ecosystem? Yeah, of course. Um, well, basically, uh, now there are different you know, bundles of products, but when we started, the, the products were separated. Right. So, one year ago, more or less. So, um, yeah, we decided to, to, to use the, well, in the case of the IoT, we are using the message broker because um, the capabilities of uh, having uh, in parallel uh, two different transports, which is the MQTT and MQP. So this is uh, very useful for us. And we use it to, uh, as a hub of data coming from, currently we have a proxy because they, we are re relying uh, legacy systems in the terminal, but uh, the plan is to have full-fledged IoT systems. I mean, one IoT gateway in each crane, in each truck, in each uh, machinery. But currently we have a proxy reading the PLCs coming from the, from the terminal, but this is, is going to be changed. Um, uh, for this, the the uh, message broker has a like a messaging hub mission. Uh, on top of this, we use the complex event processor to do a kind of a stream processing. So I'm very excited with the new announcements because uh, this absolutely fits on our strategy. Because uh, what we are doing is to set up metrics based on very raw 
uh, measurements in the cranes. So, for instance, when the uh, container is taken, I mean, ver very low level uh, measurements. We combine them in the complex seven processor by having a deep uh, sequence of uh, different execution plans. And with these metrics, we represent them. Currently, we are not using the uh, um, data analytics um, dashboard. Right. We are using a, a different technology. Uh, but is, this is because we are focusing more in the flexibility and the navigability of the metrics uh, for, for operators in the terminal. Um, apart from this, we also use the ESV, but we, we do a lightweight use of the ESV because we uh, use it to expose some uh, REST services in order to have some control, some automatic control between the different um, signals coming from the different uh, components of the system. So we do a kind of automation by, by, by using the enterprise service bus. Great. And, and uh, to Daniel now. So so in an e-commerce world, as you mentioned, integration is a key part, and int integration plays a key role in combining the various systems, the payment systems. Uh, so you went into the business architecture. Would you be able to go into detail on how that technical architecture works, uh, whether you have API management in front of that, whether you do analytics as well on top of that? Yeah, I can, I can talk about my, my previous experience uh, about the, 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 the importance of these standards in the, in the community. So. Um, Whenever you want to, to have multiple systems uh, easily connect with each other, we need to define uh, a standards, or the community needs to define uh, these standards. So you have like just plug and play systems uh, connecting to, to each other. So uh, I used to, to explain to, to other people that um, if I start speaking Portuguese, I think no one in this room will understand what, what I will say. So we need to create something that in an interoperable way we can uh, use and, and define as a standard so everyone connects the same way, no matter what the system does in, the, in, their, in their specific environment. Okay? Uh, so uh, the, import the importance of these standards um, um, is also, um, well, the community is important to, to the definition of these standards because the community has to agree on the, the, syntax, the syntax and the semantics that uh, are uh, to be used in this, in this uh, interoperable, interoperable world. So uh, I think the community needs, in, in every sector, from healthcare to finance to retail, uh, we need to, to create this kind of committees or this, we need to create, no, they, they exist, but we need to, to, to give the power to, uh, and contribute to, to, these, to these committees to, to create these standards. So uh, they can facilitate our life when, when we are creating these interoperable connections between the systems. Okay, so uh, let me pause before I come to say again, any questions from the audience so far? on the various projects or so any of the aspects that we spoke about, including open standards, uh, the business architectures, so on and so forth. Okay, no questions? So, okay, uh, so Seneca, so you have worked with a pretty large clients, right? Uh, both in the UK as well as uh, globally, like Fortune 500 clients, uh, including like, so we, we heard some of the uh, customer user stories as well from Travis Perkins, from uh, the Transport for London, uh, London Works, so on and so forth. Uh, so. From a solutions architect's perspective, so you, you spoke about how we help customers on an evaluation level yep. before they select WSO2. But after they select WSO2 and they're working on a project that keeps on going for two, three years, can you explain like how we better partner with the customer, how we work with them to make that uh, long-term engagement a success? Yeah, so uh, happy to uh, explain. So um, I think a customer is uh, uh, expecting uh, us to be like a trusted advisor. Uh, because uh, once a customer realizes that a product can do something uh, and then they start using it uh, for certain certain capabilities of theirs or certain certain requirements of theirs likewise, uh, they would want to get some advice as to how to make use of that um, uh, for them to achieve uh, much more uh, in, in terms of what they're trying to do. Or else how can they reuse the same capability in another area of the business so that uh, now there is more return over the investment that they have made, right? Uh, 
so in this context, uh, as a solutions architect, um, um, uh, the, the, the kind of role uh, that I play or any of our colleagues would play is to kind of uh, work with the customer to understand uh, what is your roadmap uh, and also to explain what is our roadmap then uh, introduce our customers to maybe others of the, 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 the you know, like the same uh, industry or same area uh, so that they can exchange, you know, experiences they've had. Uh, we also tend to do workshops. We uh, help people with hackathons, especially if you're running an AP management program. You might have done things internally by yourselves and you must have done a great job. You have a great tool also, but you need to kind of promote that. Uh, to your partner base and uh, there is some work that ne you, you need to do uh, in order for your project to be successful. So as a vendor uh, or a supplier, uh, we work very closely with our customers uh, so that they can then take what they have built and promote it uh, to their partner community or to their customer community uh, and, and then get the kind of return or in, in, uh, the uh, investment they've made too. So the focus, I would say, is to become the uh, trusted advisor. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Andy. So, uh, so Miguel, the next question is uh, from you. So, so Daniel spoke about open standards, mm -hmm. the importance of open standards yep. uh, for interoperability. Uh, but I'll come to you for the importance of open source. So you've been working with uh, many of the open source GIS uh, systems out there as well. So why, why do you think open source is important and why do you think uh, the WCD ESB being an open source system is important for your projects? Well, in research projects is key to have open source um, technologies. Open source in research projects gives you, the, the, the first benefit gives you is that uh, you don't struggle for the I IPR with the rest of the partners. Uh, research projects in Europe are usually composed 10, 15 partners. And uh, going open source is the easiest way to say, okay, we are developing this. We are basing on open source technologies and we are getting back to the to the community what we are developing in the in the scope of this project so this is a this is key and licenses such as apache or mit are a good solution for companies that uh, after developing this wants to um, fairly create a, a product and sell it to the to the customers so this is uh, uh, of key importance in our case and that's one of the reasons of uh, of adopting WSO2 as a first class citizen in the in inter IoT project as well because we have the all the source code so that we can play and uh, we can integrate with the rest of the of the interoperability layers developing inter IoT without um, you know licensing is issues so yeah in the context of research is key and also in the const context of uh, business our company ProDevelop is um, greatly experience it in, in working with um, uh, open source integrations, open source adaptations to customers. So we are a uh, huge experience on that. So this uh, strategy of open sourcing WSO2 also fits with us. Thank you. So Daniel, coming to you. So uh, since you are building an integration layer, which is a, a key component, again, mm -hmm. to run the whole uh, Farfetch system as well. Uh, so how how did your team basically learn WSO2? How did you get onboarded onto WSO2? Mm -hmm. You mentioned documentation yes. was good, but what else uh, did you do and what were the challenges? Yes, we, we use uh, documentation very much. And, um, and one, one thing that I didn't refer previously was the ease to, to build th something that goes live very quick running. So. Two years ago, we were like three people in the team. Now we are 20. Okay. Yeah, so uh, it's very easy for, uh, to, to do the onboard of these, of these engineers to the team and make them like in, in two to three weeks to have something being deployed live, uh, a single project for a stock sync or, or an order sync with, uh, with, some, with some partner. So this is a key aspect that I need to, to, to stress out here. Yeah. Um, so um, right now we are organized in. We just split the team. We ha we have like a, a core team that is responsible for creating the canonical model inside our inside our platform and creating the the templates and the core functionalities that deal with the, with the, the generic transactions to Farfetch. 
and then we have a, a, a bigger team that is um, developing over this core, um, this core um, component uh, and delivering projects to specific clients for Gucci, for, for other boutiques, etc. Okay, so that, this is the way we are organized. So in the past two years, we were in an hurry to, to deliver projects. We are, we are still in an hurry to, to deliver projects. So it's not quite easy to, to do a, a better job to organize. We, we are still in the process of organizing these, uh, these teams. Um, and we, we intend to, um, to, uh, to get involved with, with Ballerine and uh, API Manager, etc. We have this, this core team that will do this job. Uh, in the next month, so All right. that's the way we are organized. Okay. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Daniel. Okay. Um, any other questions from the audience? No. Okay. So, uh, Selek, I'll come to you. So, so the cloud. We see a lot of cloud adoption uh, in today's environment. Uh, so, how do you see cloud playing a role with uh, many of the larger customers, especially in the EU and the UK region, and uh, do many of the customers coming to WSO to also look for cloud? Is there, is there uh, like hybrid models of cloud they can use as well? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so cloud is uh, certainly interesting and appealing for uh, several prospects, customers uh, in the same way. Uh, I think cloud was uh, uh, something that people always wanted to have on their kind of roadmap anyway. Uh, so at some point, somebody is going to ask you at least one question about cloud. Uh, it is the case anyway. Uh, so regardless of what region in the world you are, people have questions about cloud these days. But I think cloud is also giving you an opportunity uh, to use like a, a self-service kind of a interaction with uh, products or capabilities, tools like that. Now, open source is convenient uh, in a way so that you can uh, use the product, see the source code, and so and so forth. You can get more hands-on, and so and so forth. Right? Uh, cloud also helps in uh, uh, a sort of a, uh, a way because uh, you don't really need the kind of infrastructure to run cloud services. Uh, you don't need to really spend uh, plenty of time to do automation and so and so forth to make it work. You can build prototypes, you can try it out, you can prove that something works and very rapidly uh, you can show the kind of advantage that you can get out of a solution. So this has been the, the main reason why many people actually want cloud and try out cloud. But also, uh, we have some of our customers who are actually using cloud in like a, either pure cloud setting or like a hybrid cloud setting. So they have production environments running on cloud. So TFL is a good example. They uh, use some of our cloud services as well. Uh, TFL is a traditional business acquisition of uh, many transport sector things now merged into one uh, big organization. Uh, they, are, they are continuing to grow and, and bring in lots of things and they are innovating all the time. Uh, so cloud is essential for them. Uh, because uh, they don't want to then be reliant on uh, their existing older infrastructure, they don't have challenges for upgrading infrastructure, so and so forth. Uh, so they are also um, uh, working with, say, Amazon, Azure, and so and so forth, and as a part of this whole ecosystem, they find us to be playing a very uh, key role, because uh, we are agnostic of, of IAS, we don't couple ourselves to any capability. Uh, it's not like we only work with Amazon or Azure or Google or something like that, we can work across the board. Uh, we also can integrate their existing landscape. This is very important for most of our customers because uh, the moment you go to cloud, you cannot forget everything or write an ETL process that brings uh, on-premise to cloud and, and then do everything on cloud. Mm -hmm. It's a continuous integration of everything, right? Uh, so this is, I think, the, the main reason why people see our platform as a very useful capability for them. Uh, and, and of, of course, the, the agility to do things very fast. So these two areas, I think, was the, ma the main reason. Uh, for cloud, in at least in this region, I think it's the same everywhere. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Seneca. So since we are closer to lunchtime, uh, we don't want to go over time because people need to get lunch. That's important. So uh, thank you very much, uh, thank you. all three panelists. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Miguel. Thanks, Seneca. Thank you. Uh, hopefully this was useful for you. So we selected the panel because there are three different extremes, right? So Miguel is from a large enterprise working on an internal integration project. Uh, sorry, Miguel, sorry. Daniel is my bad. <laughs> Daniel no. is from large enterprise yeah. working on an in internal integration project for a very large e-commerce website. Uh, Miguel is basically working on products, product design, specifically around the IoT area, specifically around open source, uh, open standards, 
uh, interoperability standards and, and basically EU funded research projects. So, so that's interesting. And then Senec, of course, is from WSO to so Senec has worked with many of the large two um, SME organizations and he has extensive experience in that area. So um, thank you again, gentlemen, for sharing your insights, sharing your knowledge, sharing your experience. Uh, again, uh, they'll be around, so you can ask any questions directly from them. Yeah. And uh, hopefully you found this session interesting. So I think lunch is outside. And uh, thank you again for attending. Thank you.